now. But here it is. It's noon here in North Dakota. It's a little chilly and cold, but spring is coming, so it'll be okay. And uh, I just want to introduce everybody that you'll see on here today. And I don't know if, Will, if you can come back or not on your Hello. video. Yes. Hello, everybody. So Will Beaton is going to be speaking the part of Paul Thorlickson, and he did a great job on the video. It's, it's a recording, so you'll be able to see that. And, but we'll have interaction on the beginning and at the end with some question and answer time. And Will lives in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And I live in Fargo, North Dakota. And my name is Sunna. And then Doug Hansen lives in Virginia and is originally from Washington State. And he is wearing two hats today. So he is here as an Icelandic Roots volunteer and is on the board and takes care of all the places and the finance. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then he also is the vice president and the um, treasurer for INLUS. So this webinar platform is handled by INLUS so that Icelandic Roots doesn't have to purchase another whole subscription to the Zoom webinar because most of what we do is on seminars where we have a Zoom seminar where people can interact with each other. And this is one of our public offerings for a webinar. And we also have quite a few that are uh, membership only webinars and seminars. So if you're not a member, come and join us. And uh, thanks to Doug and the INLUS for this. And everyone's going to be muted, but there is a question and answer section at the bottom of the screen. And thank you for being here with us today. And let's get started. So Doug will cue up the, the video. Pastor Paul Thorlickson is known as the father of the Icelandic settlement of Dakota. It includes the area within this black box, plus areas up to Pembina and down to Grafton. This video features a significant oral narrative from this very important leader as he spoke from his deathbed in Pembina County, Dakota Territory in 1882. His close acquaintance, the Unitarian minister Bjorn Pietersen, requested that his story be recorded as a valuable part of our Icelandic story. We will begin with a very brief introduction about Pastor Paul, followed by the oral narrative, which was originally in Icelandic. The entire video will be in the English language. Paul was born the 13th of November, 1849, to a thriving and educated family. His father was educated by a pastor, and his mother's father was Reverend Magnus Erlensen. This is Paul's family in 1863 when he was 13 years old. Paul and his brother, Haraldur, emigrated to America in 1872. His parents and seven siblings immigrated the next year. They were a well-educated, religious, and a prominent family in Iceland who had raised these nine living children. At the time, the population of Iceland was about 70,000 and around 2,000 people lived in Reykjavik. 15% of the people in the country were craftspeople or government employees. 10% worked within the fishing industry. But the majority, 75% of the population, were farmers. Most people were in the rural areas and lived in turf farm homes. Iceland only had two doctors and a few midwives with some higher education and medical training. There were no public schools, but Iceland had a very high literacy rate. All homes had at least one book, and many were religious books like the Psalms or the Bible. Paul was instructed by Pastor Bjorn Halterson when he was 13 years old. He then went to Reykjavik for further education he was an excellent student. He graduated from college in Reykjavik in 1871 with honors. Paul and his family lived here the longest. In the spring of 1872, at the age of 22, 
Paul and three others set off for the South with plans to emigrate to America. They were his brother, sister-in-law, and Arni Sveinbjörnsson, the brother of Sveinbjörn, who composed Iceland's national anthem. There was much talk about the wide expanses and the potential for success in America. In 1870, four promising young men left Arabaki for America. Two years later, on June 13, 1872, Paul and this famous group also left from Arabaki on the ship Thor, heading to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They arrived in Liverpool after 17 days. Then they arrived in Halifax after 11 more days, and then Quebec City two days later. Next, it was on to Wisconsin via the railroad. All the passenger lists, ships and ports, plus stories, maps, and more are available in the Icelandic Roots database. Also, learn more about the Wisconsin Icelanders on our YouTube or Vimeo channels with the last presentation by Icelandic Roots volunteer, Willie Engelson. Paul attended the Concordia Theological Seminary at St. Louis, Missouri, and graduated on the 30th of June, 1875. He was immediately appointed pastor in Wisconsin where the first Icelandic Lutheran congregation in North America was organized on October 10, 1875. In the fall of 1875, 275 Icelanders left Kinmont, along with 13 from Wisconsin, and made their way to the new settlement which was called New Iceland in Manitoba. They landed there on the 21st of October, 1875, at a place called Willow Point. The winter was extremely difficult. The next summer, much of their first crop failed and there was even snow in July. In the fall of 1876, over a thousand Icelandic immigrants, most of them destitute, arrived in New Iceland, Manitoba. And then a severe smallpox epidemic swept through the settlement. Over a hundred people died, mostly young children. This monument near Gimli was erected to honor those victims. Times were so tough for the settlers in New Iceland. The devastating smallpox ep epidemic, along with substantial snow and rain, caused the lake to flood. Afterwards, huge batches of mosquitoes created even more misery. Sigtrigger Jonasson is the father of New Iceland in Manitoba. He has also given credit for founding the publication called Framfari, in September of 1877. Here you can see him and Paul Thorlikson. So much has been written about Sigtrigger and other leaders of the day in New Iceland. As they struggled in their new homeland with disease and hardships, the poor and weakened Icelanders also had the freedom to choose their religious beliefs. As time went on, religious, political, and Overall friction over the future of the settlement divided the people. Those who followed Pastor Jón Bjarnason were called Jónsmen, and those who followed Paul Thorlikson were called Palsmen. By 1878, the Palsmen left New Iceland to settle in Dakota. There is much more to this story, and I highly recommend this book by George J. Hauser. While Sarah Paul, Pastor Paul, only lived in North America for 10 years, his outstanding accomplishments and vision created a legacy that continues today for the Icelandic descendants of Dakota. Let's move on now to the feature where Pastor Paul explains the founding of the Icelandic settlement in Dakota, which he dictated on the 11th of February, 1882. The English translation is spoken by Will Beaton of Grand Forks, North Dakota. 
It was in the fall of 1876 that I made my first acquaintance with the so-called Red River Valley. The news reached me while in Wisconsin, where I was serving Icelandic and Norwegian congregations that more than a thousand Icelanders were on their way across Canada, intending not to stop until they had reached the just-discovered New Iceland, Nia Island, in western Canada. When this became known from Norwegian papers in Wisconsin, the committee of the Norwegian Synod, whose duty it is to look after Norwegian immigrants, who come to this country without a pastor and settle in uninhabited districts, urged me to visit these countrymen of mine. As is known, I complied with the request and my journey took me through the valley mentioned. At that time, railroads did not extend far northward through the valley. Therefore, I had to take passage in a Red River steamer, 150 miles as the crow flies, and four to 500 by river, northward, to the city of Winnipeg in Manitoba. The captain informed me that he had just before transported a number of Icelanders to Winnipeg and lamented the fact that so many desirable people were taken past the fertile, uninhabited districts on either side of the Red River northward to a region which he considered uninhabitable. He suggested to me that I attempt to turn them back. I at once pointed out to him how impossible that would be under their present circumstances, as they, moreover, had in prospect substantial aid from the Canadian government if they settled in New Iceland. Besides, I had not personally investigated nor determined whether New Iceland was to be considered uninhabitable. A year and a half passed by, in the spring of 1878, I had sojourned some six months in New Iceland and had traversed the district back and forth, even in uninhabited parts. It then seemed to me evident that there was little or no possibility of the Icelanders ever prospering in that region. And obviously, if matters were left to take their course and no attempt made to find a more promising location to which to direct the New Icelanders and Icelandic immigrants, then more and more people from Iceland would be brought into the same hardships. I therefore decided to see a more advantageous location immediately that spring, although because of their extreme poverty, it was doubtful whether many could avail themselves to the opportunity to emigrate. The following men accompanied me, Johan Haltsen, his son Gunnar, and Magnus Stephenson from Gimli, in Winnipeg, Sigurdr Josa Bjornsson, and Arni Thorlaxen joined us. When we left Gimli, it was uppermost in our minds not to search for land until in Lyon County, Minnesota, in the vicinity of the Icelandic settlement there. During our stay in Winnipeg, Magnus Stephenson chanced to have a conversation with a certain editor who said he was acquainted with conditions in North Dakota and that he could not direct us to a better location than the so-called Pemina Mountain. This man seemed genuinely touched by the hardships of the Icelanders in New Iceland and desired to have an opportunity to speak to me about the Pemina locality. At first, I thought that he was a land speculator who owned lands in the district and therefore wished to see them settled at the earliest date. Nevertheless, I considered it unwise to ignore his counsel altogether. Hence, my companions and I decided to stop at Pemina, just south of the Canadian border from there, make a journey westward to the Pemina Mountains. This was probably about the middle of April. The weather was very mild. We left the steamer at Pemina late in the day and stayed overnight at an unimpressive lodging house on the riverbank, for at that time there were not many, much less noteworthy, buildings in the place. The next morning we traveled on foot westward over the prairie south of the so-called Tongue River, which flows east from the Pemina Hills. Not a house was then to be seen on the prairie, and only here there were along the edge of the forest on the riverbank. We called at several houses and asked sundry questions about the locality. The majority of those questioned had little information except about their own homesteads and those of their neighbors, and they were well pleased with their own farms. Yet there were those who surmised the existence of the hills, to the west, and believed that tillable land was to be found there. The most valuable information we received was from a wealthy German farmer, John Betchel, 
at whose house we remained overnight at the post office of Cavalier, 24 miles southwest of Pemina. He had farmed in the district for two years. Here were the outskirts of the settlement along the Tongue River, but then began a continuous wilderness on all sides. From Cavalier, we journeyed the next day in the same direction out into the wilderness. Then the forest along the river became more extensive, the land higher and less fertile. We walked on either side of the river, which forms there a deep valley, until we were in sight of mountains. Then the land, all of a sudden, became lower. As far as the eye could see, to the south and west, we saw before us green lowlands with stretches of wood. In the west, the hills met the eye. The appearance of the land now seemed to us what we call in Iceland, rural. As soon as the land again became lower, we found the same rich soil as before in the, on the grassy plains. We stopped here a while and agreed upon turning back as it was late in the day and we were tired. We also decided that my companions should remain behind and further investigate this district which now lay before us. I should, on the other hand, inspect land in Dakota and Minnesota, 300 miles farther south, as I had planned. I considered it self-evident that we should select a site for a settlement east of the hills, although as yet far from a market town, because of the large forests seemingly ample throughout the region, if the soil proved to be equally fertile elsewhere as where we were halting at the time. The reader will now surmise that we had been permitted to view that district, yet mostly from a distance, which is now called the Icelandic Settlement in Dakota, and already is inhabited by more than 600 Icelanders, many of whom own beautiful farms and a goodly number of cattle. The following night we stayed at the home of a Norwegian, Butler Olsen by name, who had a farm in the forest southwest of Cavalier. He had shortly before arrived there, the only settler of his nationality, with his wife and children. He received us like brothers and welcomed us into his neighborhood. Half a year has passed by. At that time, I am returning from Minnesota and Wisconsin to New Iceland as a residing pastor for those congregations which had been organized there the winter before under my supervision. On my way north, I had made a detour to visit my companions in the Pemina Hills. Two of them had homesteaded close by Olsen, but two others, Johan Haltsen and his son, and a third one who had joined them, a son-in-law of Johan, Gisli Egelsen, had settled a short distance west of where we had stopped earlier in the spring. I gave them a detailed account of my inspection of land farther south, adding that I was in no doubt about choosing a site for settlement in the Pemina district rather than in Minnesota, primarily for two reasons. First, because the former location was much more accessible to New Icelanders, and secondly, because if offered convenient and extensive timber, whereas in Minnesota only grassy plains devoid of woods were to be found. After we had parted in the spring, Johan Haltsen had not long hesitated in returning to New Iceland to fetch his family and possessions. This aroused considerable interest among the people of New Iceland. The winter wore on. Men began to think about the question of emigrating and to discuss it, at first among themselves, and opinions differed as often is the case. Some even began writing patriotic songs of New Iceland. From Fari circulated these, but the public did not seem ready to respond to them. People became more and more convinced that the future of New Iceland was anything but promising. On the other hand, it was a matter of concern to leave one's homes and the fruits of one's labors during a long period, government loan, half-built churches, and the graves of one's beloved, and then have to begin anew in another wilderness. Finally, the movement for emigrating had reached such dimensions that the president of the district council, Olafur Olafsson Frau Espioli, called a meeting, which was, however, attended by comparatively few people. On that occasion, I declared that it was doubtless right for people to remain undisturbed in New Iceland. 
if they had sufficient reasons to expect that they could earn a decent living for themselves and their dependents and could live together like Christian and civilized individuals. If, however, they did not have such reasons, then it was their duty, for their own sake and for that of their descendants, to seek at the earliest opportunity in every permissible manner a more hospitable location. Finally, it was decided to commission Olafur Olafsson and myself to write a description of New Iceland and a petition to the government concerning emigration from the district. The petition should then be circulated to be signed by those wishing to have a part in the undertaking. Time went on past midwinter. More men made the troublesome journey south across the border to inspect the land. Among these was John Bergman, who in turn wrote to New Iceland some of the most detailed news from North Dakota, and his letter aroused much attention as the writer was known for exceptional prudence in word and deed. It may be pointed out here that the distance from Gimli, New Iceland, to Pemina is 120 miles, and from the westward to the hills, 40 miles. Because of lack of funds, most of the people had to traverse this distance on foot. Neither could one possibly see how women, children, and old people could make this journey without assistance. But it was imperative not to draw back. The undertaking was urgent and of great import. On the other hand, there was strong opposition in every way from the government agents and their friends. I discussed the matter with my congregations, inquiring whether it was their firm desire to emigrate southward, and generally people favored such a course, saying, however, that they did not see how they could undertake such a journey unaided. By this time, Olafur and I, or rather Olafur alone, had completed writing the document to the Canadian government, had received the signatures of 130 family fathers, had translated the document into English, and sent it to the government. The government's answer is too well known to call for repletion, but we thought only of saving ourselves and those who wished to be rescued from the mire. Summer came. People gradually surmounted their difficulties, largely because of the financial aid given by the Norwegians at my intercession. As a result, about 50 families had settled on choice lands east of the Pemina Hills in the fall of 1879. That summer, I came to the district to stay. I homesteaded in what is now the center of the settlement. Here, with the help of my countrymen, I built myself a house. At that time, my health had already become impaired, and I was far from fit to accompany the position which I now held. But much was yet undone of what needed to be accomplished. The foundation of the settlement had, to be sure, been laid, but a long winter waited at the door of the toil-worn and destitute people far out in a wilderness. Some lost heart. Others indulged in evil prophecies and talked of returning to New Iceland. I had begun this undertaking in the name of the Lord and firmly trusted that he would bring it to a happy fruition. Nor was that trust put to shame. The winter passed, and it was one of the most severe which people had experienced in these parts. Many homes were sometimes without food at the same time but through loans from neighbor farmers, which I had to take upon myself to pay at a certain date, and through collections from Norwegians in various parts of the Norwegian Synod, it was always possible to remedy the situation in time so that no loss resulted. As far as possible, everything was used sparingly, and let it be said in all justice that the people were very frugal during that winter. The reader must bear in mind that most of the families had not as yet had a crop of any kind, and now it was imperative that they should remain to cultivate their lands and make hay in preparation for the next summer. But as may be expected, both seed and food were lacking in the spring of 1880. I therefore induced my brother, Harold, who had come from Wisconsin the year before with a considerable number of livestock, to join me in mortgaging his stock for seed and food, 
and the number of the most needed agricultural implements. About this time, I happened to be staying in Minnesota for my health, but I had frequent news of conditions both in Dakota and New Iceland. Among other things, I heard that a strenuous effort had been made in New Iceland to hinder Norwegians from rendering any further assistance in our undertaking. For that purpose, a meeting for, from the whole district had been called, where it had been declared that my doings were creating an unfavorable impression and were in general considered a disgrace to the Icelanders. At the meeting, it had been decided that an article protesting my emigration activities should be written and published in both Norwegian and English papers. A little later, I received this article in Norwegian. I read it and reflected upon its contents and felt that it could cause me some trouble temporarily as regards collections and other help. For at that time, aid was greatly needed as the situation was in Dakota. The article declared that this emigration activity on my part was entirely unnecessary. New Iceland offered a splendid future, and the people were generally highly satisfied with their condition. The Icelanders were described as much enraged at my action. The news which I had written from New Iceland was declared false, and it was charged that there were other misstatements as well. Everything considered... I saw that in order to weaken the effect of the article when published, I had to do two things. First, to publish in the papers a short reply to the article, and secondly, to undertake a journey among the Norwegians in Minnesota and explain the situation to them and urge them to give ready assistance. I began by approaching the merchant with whom I was staying showed him the article, and persuaded to promise to lend our settlement 100 barrels of wheat for one year and 40 head of cattle for two years at a 10% interest. Thereupon, I wrote to the officials of the St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Manitoba Railroad Company at St. Paul, asking them to transport the cattle and the flour free of charge. It is a distance of 400 miles, Otherwise, the transportation would have cost me $300. The company at once responded favorably. The flour and the stock from the merchant reached Pemina, yet only 25 head of cattle at that time. The news quickly spread throughout the settlement. People's hopes were revived, but despite this aid, there were still many in dire need. The merchant shook his head at my audacity, saying that he did all this for me. I then asked him to lend me a horse that I might visit Norwegian farmers in his vicinity and persuade them to lend me an equal number of cattle. He laughed, but nevertheless lent me a horse. Two weeks later, I had 34 head of cattle brought into the merchant's stockyard, and he then added nine of his own. Again, I wrote to the above-mentioned railroad company at St. Paul, informed them of what the farmers had done, and inquired what the cost of transportation on their railroad would now be. They replied immediately, saying that they would also transport these cattle free of charge, but they would make no further promises. Together with two Norwegian cattlemen, I accompanied the cattle northward to Pemina and thence to my home at Mountain. Clearly, people were jubilant over this acquisition, but it soon disappeared like a drop in the ocean. For now, a number of destitute people from New Iceland had been added to the settlement. I had borrowed these cattle from the farmers on the same condition as the stock borrowed previously, with the exception that they asked a lower price. Nevertheless, here in Dakota, I had to place upon this stock about the same value as the former to be able to use some of it in our partial payment of the debts which I was under obligation to pay at once on behalf of our settlement. For this purpose, I had only $200 of borrowed money. Shortly after my arrival, I called a meeting, explained to the people what I had done, and sought further information about their condition generally and their hopes of getting along during the coming winter. For provided they could do so, I considered the district safe. 
I offered to journey some 200 miles into Minnesota and attempt once more to gather borrowed cattle from the Norwegian congregations there. This proposal was well received, and the people promised to do all in their power to find work, and it is safe to assert that few, if any, had shirked since they came here. In July, I returned south again, yet only half of the distance I had journeyed before. There, I either rode or drove through the Norwegian settlements, and I was everywhere well received, especially by the rural pastors, who either lent me a mount or drove me about free of charge. They always accompanied me and supported my cause nobly among their parishioners. After nearly two months of travel of this kind, I had been promised 85, 85 head of cattle, young and old, and 65 sheep, besides a small sum of money. Then at my instructions, two men and two boys from our settlement joined me. With the aid of the Norwegians, we gathered together the stock mentioned, drove it northward, and brought most of it safe and sound to our home on October 2nd. I then appointed a committee of three to place a fair value on this stock, and at that price we loaned most of it throughout the district, on the condition that it be paid in three years. One-third a year, free of interest. But some of the cattle we sold to meet the food debt of the settlement. This stock I had received either as a loan or as outright gifts but to guarantee my creditors payment of their loans to the settlement, I had to sell all the borrowed cattle, which, however, was scarcely sufficient, even if the settlement had met its obligations on time. Here let me add that such minds may, unfortunately, be found in our settlement, who find it a matter difficult to understand how I could have received some of the stock as a gift and yet have good reasons for selling all of it when it arrived here. But such difficulties can never be avoided, and no difficult deed of charity would be accomplished if one lost heart because of being misunderstood and suspected of evil motives by some people. At last, there seemed good reason to believe that our settlement would survive next winter, as several farmers had had a fair crop that fall, and moreover, several self-supporting individuals and even men of means had arrived in our district that summer from Lyon County, Minnesota, and from Shawano County, Wisconsin. Many had also returned from harvest work with considerable sums of money. And lastly, many men of the same means had come from Winnipeg and elsewhere in Manitoba. In New Iceland, the situation was now such that even those who, during the spring, had before exalted that district, were tired out and wished above all to leave. For shortly after their above-mentioned article had appeared in the papers, Lake Winnipeg rose, and in many places flowed over the settlement so that the eyes of the short-sighted were opened and even they could now see that New Iceland was then, on the whole, too swampy a region for the development of large settlements. This flood was followed by others, and as a result, the authors of the aforementioned article gave up sending to the papers new reports of the agreeable conditions in New Iceland. Since then, over a year has passed by, and it is remarkable how our settlement has progressed in that time. Nor is it likely that anyone familiar with the conditions will any longer doubt that the district will have flourished greatly within a few years. That prospect is not least warranted by the fact that a wealthy railroad company appears to have decided to build its road east of the hills the whole length of the settlement. Other nations now vie in coming here. All admire the beauty and the richness of the land, in the convenient distribution of sufficient woods, meadows, and excellent running water from the hills. Consequently, the land is settled almost in its entirety. In fact, at the present time, the settlements can hardly be extended except westward into the hills, which have not as yet been surveyed. These hills we have so far explored but partly. I myself have, for instance, been no farther than three or four miles westward in that region. The hillsides and the vales to the east are covered with woods and willows, and above these extends an undulating grassy plain as far as the eye can see. 
Several people, Icelanders as well as others, have already homesteaded there and are well pleased with the quality of the soil. What we call our settlement may be said to be a region 16 miles long and 6 to 12 miles broad. Those who say they have journeyed farthest westward declare that far to the west on the hills are forests and lakes full of fish and the same excellent soil, and that still farther west there are moorlands or mountains which far surpass the ones nearer in scenic beauty and otherwise. For the time being, people are not permitted to settle farther west than 24 miles from the outskirts of the moorlands, but as is customary, the region will doubtless be expanded by the United States government when the settlement extends farther west. The reader will now unsurprisingly think that my words have become many, but I would like to add one small point, which seems to me to be well suited to give my countrymen a clear idea of how quickly a diligent farmer can achieve in these lands. In the summer of 1879, two single young men, Sigurjón Sveinsen, and Benedict Johannesson came here from Wisconsin, took adjoining lots of land, and built unimposing shelters. They formed a partnership and took turns being at home and haying for others. They were probably cash poor, but they knew how to work on the land here. In the autumn of 1881, or the next, they harvested 400 barrels of the best wheat and 150 of oats, as well as common vegetables. They also brought and bred a few cattle during this period. Confined to my bed, suffering from a long illness, I have put the foregoing together by request, but another has written it down. I guarantee that if anything is misstated, it can only be matters of no consequence. My purpose has been realized if my account contributes to a better understanding of the aim and the causes of the founding of the settlement in question. And so may the Lord be praised for his faithful help to us, undeserving sinners. Paul Thorlickson, Mountain, Pemina County, North Dakota, February 11th, 1882. The dynamic, determined, and respected pastor died 29 days later, March 12th, 1882, at the young age of 32 years, in Mountain Dakota Territory. He had been suffering for years from consumption, also called tuberculosis. The symptoms are total exhaustion with a relentless cough and spurts of blood. Pastor Paul did not live to see his efforts and his dreams accomplished. Because of severe weather, the burial service was not held until April 12th, one month later. Four pioneer children were baptized at the casket. This monument marks his grave and was erected by his countrymen in 1894. After Paul's death, his younger brother, Neil Steingrimer, served as interim pastor, but he had not yet been ordained. He was also the first public school teacher in the Northeast Dakota settlement. Their cousin, Hans Thorgrimsen, who emigrated in 1872 with Paul and the group, was called and he came to lead the people. Under his leadership, he helped the Ladies' Aid to form as well as Sunday schools and young people's societies and the Icelandic Lutheran Synod. His life deserves an entire video presentation, but a quick recap is that he became one of the most beloved and influential pastors in the North American communities. Much is known about this family, and you can visit the home in Arabaki, which is now a museum. In 1884, the Viker Church was built under the leadership of Pastor Hans. He was one of the founders of the Icelandic Synod in June of 1885, and there were literary societies, libraries, musical groups, and more. He was responsible for seeing many of the churches built, a large stone with a plaque stands at the west end of the log cabin church location. The plaque reads, Largest Icelandic Settlement in the United States. Pembina Halsen Accra, 1878, Mountain and Garter, 
1879. In the 1940s, a new foundation was laid north of the log cabin church. Then that log cabin structure was moved on top of the new basement and foundation to become the church that we know of today. The Veeker Lutheran Church, built in 1884, is the oldest Icelandic church in North America and is on the National Register of Historic Places. It is well preserved by donations and volunteer work by the community. Many people have been baptized, confirmed, married, had funerals, Christmas programs, and more from this beautiful church, including me. The Icelandic flag in the steeple shines brightly over this historic Icelandic area. It is such a treasure. Besides Viker, eight other Icelandic churches were built in Northeast North Dakota settlement. Those still in service as Icelandic churches are the Garder Pioneer, Vidalin, Fjetla, Garder Luthers, and Peters. The Pembina Church was sold to the Ukrainians. The Halson Church is part of a historic buildings and museum exhibit at the Icelandic State Park. The Thingvala Church was burned in an accidental fire in 2003 and now has a beautiful Christus statue, storyboard panels, and a memorial site at the cemetery. This is also where Cowan Julius is buried and his monument stands. The Icelandic communities of Northeast North Dakota continue to celebrate the Icelandic heritage and culture with their yearly 2nd of August, or the Deuce of August. Busloads of people come from Iceland and North Americans come in droves to attend this wonderful event. You can learn more on the website for the Deuce. There's so much Icelandic history here and it goes back to the father of the Icelandic settlement in Dakota, Paul Thorlikson. Pastor Paul was a man of convictions. He believed his duty was to give his countrymen the best prospects at success. He earned the long-lasting gratitude of many, but also the hostility of a few. Some people worked to disavow him and wrote letters that falsely accused him of wrongs. Their prejudice, criticism, and resentment against him continued on for some time. But his courage, sacrifices, honesty, and loyalty to his countrymen, and his duty as a pastor live on to this day. His belief never wavered that it was for the best for his people. Over time, his detractors were mostly silenced and his motives of wanting the best for all Icelandic people were upheld as pure, good, and true. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Doug. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to take some questions and answers in a, in a minute, but I just want to say that you know, as a descendant of the North Dakota pioneers, I am honored to be a descendant of the Icelandic people and to be on the international team for Icelandic roots and with family that stayed behind in Iceland and some that went to Canada and some that came to the United States. My people are found throughout the world and it's important to continue the Icelandic roots mission of keeping all of us connected. And I know that um, Will probably has some thoughts on his um, presentation and what Pastor Paul had to say. So I'll let you go, Will. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm also just really pleased and proud to be a part of this. And uh, when you sent me the letter, I read through it once. And uh, just to hear those words and to really realize that this is directly connected to my life. You know, if this man had not done what he did, and if the, the movement he was a part of had not happened, uh, there's no way I would be born. I would be alive at all today because um, this is a direct result of all of that action. So to take the time to think of that uh, perspective, uh, I think is great. And 
we're just very lucky to even know anything about our ancestors going this far back. So it's a, a special treat and it's kind of like we have a responsibility to at least be aware of it uh, a little bit. So yeah, this was a really fun project uh, for sure. And I've got a couple of favorite quotes we could talk about, but maybe we could uh, answer people's questions if there are any first. Yeah, there are some questions that are popping up. Um, and uh, Jason, doctor, do we know much about the circumstances of people leaving New Iceland for Mountain, North Dakota? The Gimli Museum describes Reverend Thorlikson's followers as leaving for theological differences, but his writing suggests he was primarily concerned with people left out for one reason or another at the New Iceland settlement. And yes, Jason, the information that is mostly talked about is the theological differences, but that was not the only reason. That was a part of the reason for going, but the United States had opened up some great land for settling and had some really good reasons for coming to the United States. North Dakota did not become a state, of course, until 1889. And so this is in 1878 when they were saying, hey, there's open land. You could come here and have this as yours. And so that was an enticement to go to Dakota Territory. There was a lot of land there, so they figured they could have a big area for the Icelandic people to settle, which they did. There were financial reasons. Of course, the smallpox and the issues and problems that they'd had with disease, which don't go away when you move. <laughs> but, um, you know, it had been so devastating to the community, and it was very difficult for the families that were there. And of course, the theological differences, the Paul's men and the Jones men. Of course, Paul and Jon were the leaders of the time that were the in the church. And so Jon Bjarnason wanted people to stay. He didn't want them to keep moving. And Paul thought it would be for the best for the people to move. And so about half of them did move down. Some moved back up to Manitoba, and he talked about that. Will talked about that in Paul's letter. And some moved on to Saskatchewan or other places in uh, the United States and Canada. And the lake um, flowing up and flooding everything. So a funny story is that my husband and a whole bunch of my friends live in the Red River Valley. And like Will's dad, and um, you know, has this great farmland, right? In, in the Red River Valley. So my ancestors walked across that wonderful <laughs> Red River Valley, awesome farmland up to where the rocks and the hills and the trees are because they wanted to be safe from the flood. They didn't want to live right by the river where it would flood and have issues. And so that's why the Icelanders ended up with some, not as good of land, but they've been able to be excellent farmers in that location anyway and have a good life. But um, there's lots of reasons. So it's not just the theological differences, which you will hear a lot about. So thanks for that question, Jason. Do you think August the Deuce will be held this year? Yes, definitely. We had our meeting on Saturday. We will be holding it live. Icelandic Roots will have a genealogical center that's going to be virtual and live. And I am probably going to convince them to do the two o'clock heritage program as a live and a webinar like we did last year. So there'll be some virtual things for people who can't travel because we know that's probably still going to be an issue for some people. So if you can come, let's make it a barn burner if you if you can come. And if not, um, check it out live on um, or on the recordings. All right, Willie, well done. Very informative. Thanks for sharing your research and knowledge. You're welcome. And thank you, Willie, for being a part of the team. Um, Let's see, excited to learn about my Icelandic ancestors. Yes, well, hopefully you're a member, Jonina, of Icelandic Roots, and you can see so much information on there. There's, it's more than just names and dates. We have so much more, plus these webinars and seminars and stuff. So um, what do we know about the women? Ah, in Icelandic Roots, every single woman that was from the North Dakota settlement, well, there might be a few missing, I know, but there are uh, biographies 
of the pioneer Icelandic women and they're attached to every single one of their pages. And we also are doing um, a work with uh, several of our volunteers have a women and children's stories project that we are collecting women and children's stories specifically for the women and children because most of the time things are written about the men in those days. And so there are a lot of stories about women and children. And if you have one, you can send it in, especially about the immigrants, the women who immigrated, the children who immigrated. And then also we're including the children who were left behind in Iceland and their stories. So that's another whole project for Icelandic roots. Um, one day I hope to visit the places you're showing us and do more research on Thurstina and her husband, the painter Emil. And they are in the database and there's lots of good information about them in there. So yeah, come and, come and check them out in the database and then you can see how you're related to them with the relationship calculator and so much more. Um, RJO, what do you know of the enterprises of Paul's brother, brother John, homesteaded where I grew up? What I know of it off the top of my head is what's already in Icelandic roots. <laughs> so I would said, say go, go there and check out what we have. And if there's some questions that you have on specific people that are Icelandic, you can send emails to support at icelandicroots.com. And the genealogists and the volunteers for Icelandic Roots will answer emails and will do more research for the members. So, yeah, check that out. Um, my great grandparents came to Garter and then moved to Brown, Manitoba. Yes, there was a lot of back and forth, back and forth across the border. I used to go to Manitoba all the time with my mama to see relatives up there, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, there wasn't really a border back then, right? It was just, we're going to see our cousins, our Icelandic friends. All right. Um, hi, all, and thanks for the remarkable story of courage and determination, but could you go f further into the real reasons for this <clears throat> argument, why people fought the movement from New Iceland to North Dakota? I answered some of that. Um, Jón Bjarnason, he really just didn't want people to move again. He wanted them to just be together and settle down and you know, work together to figure it out. And um, Paul thought they should move. And if you can get that book by um, George Hauser, it's awesome. There is a lot of information in there and more writings from Paul. I highly recommend getting that book if you'd like to learn more about that. And I am writing a lot about the some of the theological differences and have stacks and stacks and stacks of research right over here staring at me every day. And so I need to get on that someday. Um, why is brown rarely mentioned when I research? We have quite a bit in the database on brown. Um, just go to the places which Doug has and look for the brown information so you can see that. Um, Dakota history and wondering what the significance of the Icelandic State Park in settling of North Dakota. The Icelandic State Park was donated. It was land donated by an Icelandic person. And we have a lot of information on the Icelandic State Park in our blog. So if you go to icelandicroots.com, there's like over 350 blog posts. Type in Viker or Icelandic State Park or Cowanulius or mountain or garter and then you'll get a whole bunch of blog posts that have information about that that can go into a lot more detail. Is there a full text transcription of of, of what of what Will did? Yes. <laughs> In Icelandic and English, right Will? Yeah. Yeah, we can uh, make that available to people, I'm sure. Uh, post the text if you'd like to read it again, or just rewatch this wonderful video later and listen to it all again once more. All right, let's see. Um, holy, there's a lot of more questions. Is there a lot? Yeah. Yeah, my great grandfather was Paul's brother, Nels. Awesome. That's very cool. Uh, would love to get in touch with you and get some more information added about stories about him and information. Um, that would be great. Uh, send an email. Well, come and join us as a member, IcelandicRoots.com, and then um, send the information to support at IcelandicRoots.com. That'd be really great, Janet. 
and well was there more opportunity for land by moving yes and it was just opening up in north dakota well dakota territory at the time um thank you thank you thank you comment on the argyle settlement and stefan that's a whole nother presentation christine <laughs> about argyle and stefan Stephenson and and um that would definitely be a another time um Accra settlement, six children. My mother was born in 1902. Amazing. We owe them so much. Yes, you're right, Linda. Um, Vedal and Church. Yes, there's a lot of information on the Vedal and Church in the database. Uh, just type in Vedal and and we have volunteers that know a lot about Vedal and and George had a lot about Vedal and before his untimely passing that we miss him so much. Um, Peter Halson, Peter, yes, have grave sites in Blaine. Do you have history from North Dakota? Yes, lots of history on North Dakota. I think we have, well, George and we have three others that have North Dakota roots that are genealogy based volunteers on the Icelandic roots team. And Markerville in Alberta, yes, because a lot of North Dakota people went there. Yes, we know lots about them, Karen. Karen, Karen, Karen. Um, yes, we have lots of information about the Alberta and Markerville people. Um, thank you, Marianne. That would be great. Um, what do you have, Will? Well, yeah, uh, there is there is a lot to think about regarding this story and uh, so much more to learn. It definitely poses more questions than anything. Just regarding uh, Paul himself, I really found it funny in his letter how he mentioned how he borrowed a horse. You know, he's describing all of these, all these generous things that are being done for him. And then on top of that, he asked this guy to lend him a horse. And <laughs> I was recording it the first time I had to go back and redo it because I was laughing so hard because it just struck me as, as amazing. But uh, they really clearly did appreciate him and trust him and like him and wanted to support him. So I found that really interesting. And uh, definitely my favorite quote here, I pulled it up again, when he was discussing uh, the haters or, you know, the people who were, were doubting him a little bit or questioning his motives. Uh, they said, such, he, he said, such difficulties can never be avoided and no difficult deed of charity would be accomplished if one lost heart because of being misunderstood and suspected suspected of evil motives by some people. I really like that one too. I had to like sit and think about that after I recorded that line. Um, Cause it just seems true today and uh, in, in almost any situations. And, you know, he seemed to have kept true to his, his message and his hope. And it's not that he wasn't taking criticism or like, you know, reacting to feedback from others, but he persevered through the doubters and the haters. And that's a, that's a lesson we can all learn from, I think. For sure. That's a great point. Well, thank you. Doug, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Uh, not specifically related to this uh, presentation, but there is a question about maps and there is a driving map of historic places in uh, Northeast North Dakota that you produced and that I helped produce. Uh, so that was one of the questions that we received. And I don't know if that's on the website or not. We'll have to evaluate to see if that's available. But there is a brochure that we that we published with a driving route. I think it was on the website at one, like maybe a long time ago. So yeah, we should check that out again and, and add that to the website because yeah that was really good to have all the different spots and so when you do come to north dakota i hope you do come check it out and let me know you're coming and um but there is a driving map that has little snippets of information about each place so we'll follow up on that and get it on the icelandic groups website all right how big was the new town after paul thorlickson's passing did the settlement grow Yes, so the settlement continued to grow and more people came up to a point and then they started dispersing again, you know, up to Canada in different locations in Canada, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. 
Um, so, and all over the United States too. And so I had said earlier that I'm from near Garter Township. I'm in Thingvala Township, Aford area is where I grew up. But what was striking to me in doing genealogical research, and I remember this fact off the top of my head, that in 1900, there were just shy of 900 people in Garter Township. And today, there's about less than 60, 56 or 54 people in the whole entire township. And where my Icelandic ancestors lived up on the hill because they didn't come until 1882. So they, you know, were late getting there. So they had even, you know, not as good of, of property. It was up in the, in the, in the mountains. <laughs> and when they lived up there, there was people with big families living on every 160 acre square. And now in that township, East Alma Township, there are three people who live there. So, you know, it's crazy the decrease in the rural population of North Dakota. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. Um, and in, in many ways, it's like sad to see that there's so much less activity now. But on one hand, like it doesn't take away from what happened there. Like it sort of served their purpose. Like they got the Icelanders over here. And now I, I guess their descendants have moved to other parts of this country or other countries. But um, it was an important part of the transition and it, it kept the flow moving. And uh, we, we don't have to be too sad about it, I suppose. Uh, to think that it was all for nothing because there's nobody there anymore. Uh, it was all for, like me, like I, I didn't continue to live in, in those settlements, but I still got to have a life thanks to all of those people who, who did that when, when it was needed. So it's an interesting, bittersweet story there, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, we respect our Icelandic ancestors and their contributions, their courage and their sacrifices, no matter where they lived, whether they were the ones that stayed in Iceland the ones that immigrated to the U.S. or Canada or went back and forth or went back to Iceland. We respect that because they made the most of their opportunities and what they thought was the best for themselves and for their families. And through Icelandic Roots, continuing to preserve their history and genealogy and photos and more is our way to honor them. And we just thank the members who send in these photos and stories and the obituaries and headstone records. I mean, Icelandic Roots is more than just a name and a date. It is so much more in the database. Plus, we do all these educational webinars and seminars and Samtal Hour, which is a conversation hour, and Tuesday tips and new member training. And there's just so many opportunities for people that are members. and. All of us are volunteers and all the proceeds of the memberships go to pay it forward. So we give <clears throat> scholarships for Snorri programs and the Snorri Foundation and for the Icelandic National League of North America and of the United States and of Iceland and of the New Iceland Heritage Museum in Gimli and the Gimli Icelandic Camp and the Logberg Heimskringla and Riverton Icelandic Saga Sites and Markerville to, for their new um, building that they're getting ready for and uh, Utah and Minnesota and North Dakota and August the Deuce and Eastland Ingadagren. I mean, our list is really, really long of Icelandic language classes and, and so much more. So. The memberships, when you pay just a little bit, get, we gather that together and we can do some really cool things together. So thank you for being here. Is there anything further you'd like to say, Will? I've got one more comment. Yes, a quick plug for our podcast, which is one of the things that's open for non-members as well. But I heard uh, Cowan Julius was mentioned a couple times today. And uh, for those of you who don't know, he was a poet from Iceland who came to Dakota. And uh, our second podcast episode will be coming out in the coming days or weeks. And it's all about him and his life. And we read some of his poetry and some of his poetry has been set to music by a famous uh, Icelandic band. So uh, stay tuned for that and check out our podcast. It's on Spotify and anywhere you find podcasts. Awesome. Yeah, that's another fun project. There's so much to Icelandic roots and 
you really have to come and really join in and follow the blog and follow the podcasts and just see how much excitement and fun that the Icelandic Roots team is really providing all as volunteers, which is amazing. So and thank you for being we, here. Go ahead. Doug. We had a couple of questions about the video. And so we are recording this and we hope to have this uh, posted up on the website in a couple of days. And also, uh, I would encourage everyone to uh, look, check out the Icelandic National League of the United States website, inlus.org. It's also a 501c uh, nonprofit um, with a similar mission to Icelandic Roots. And in fact, Icelandic Roots is a member organization of the INLUS, and we're providing this webinar uh, space today. And so I hope everyone will check out our website and uh, consider joining that organization as well. Yeah, thank good. you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Takfira.